Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started with our service here. Go ahead and find your way to your spot there, and we'll uh, begin with some announcements real quick. <clears throat> All right. Well, I just want to say welcome. It's good to see you all here this morning as we gather to worship the Lord. If you're new here today, we would love to connect with you. And the best way that we do that is we have a little green check-in card in the pew rack in front of you. And you can fill that out. And then after service, we have little uh, gifts, little goodie baskets at the kiosk in the lobby there. And so if you fill that out and bring it to the kiosk after service, um, we'll exchange that green card for uh, a little gift for you. So that's an easy way for us to get to know you and you to get to know us, and we can connect with you and help you get connected to the church here. Um, just a few things to announce today. First off, I want to point out, um, we do Sunday school from 9 to 10 o'clock every Sunday, and we have different classes that are going on during that time. And so um, Jeannie Og has been leading a women's class, and their class got so big that they had to split into two classes, which is awesome. So Jeannie Og and Michelle Hogue are leading two different classes now. Um, Michelle is going through the book of Hebrews, and Jeannie is going to be going through the book of Isaiah. And so they're, they're just beginning that, and so if that is of any interest to you, I encourage any women to, that want to be a part of those classes to join on Sunday mornings. Their classes are the two outside classes here uh, in the courtyard, grassy area there. Um, but yeah, I encourage you. And if you have any questions, you can chat with Michelle. This is Michelle and Jeannie right here uh, about their classes. Uh, I encourage you guys. It's a great way to just get connected more to the church body, um, to be growing in our knowledge of God and what his word says. So uh, check that out. Uh, if you guys noticed, there's a little upcoming events flyer in the bulletin, and so that's covering all the, the things that are up and coming. A um, few things to point out there. We have our uh, student conference coming up. That's going to be down in the Bay Area, March 10th to the 12th, and that's for 7th to 12th grade students. Um, the youth ministry has been doing different fundraisers and stuff for that. If you're at all interested in that, please let Chase know so that he can make sure uh, he has a spot for you. Um, and that'll be a great time for the kids there. And then another thing I want to point out is we have a men's breakfast coming up. We haven't had one of these in a long time since before COVID, I think. Um, so we're getting this back up and rolling. And what we're going to be doing there is it's going to be an every other month thing. So the, f the first one's going to be March. The next one will be May. And our goal long-term wise is to potentially have something for women, the, the alternating months. And so it's not taxing families too much to be gone multiple weekends a month kind of a thing. But so for men, Saturday, March 18th, it's going to be here at the church at 8 a.m. We'll have a, an awesome breakfast provided and we'll be going through a uh, most likely a book called Disciplines of a Godly Man. And so we'll just be encouraging each other as men to be uh, grown in the faith and grow in, um, in our dependence on God for all those things. You can also see Love Does Week is coming up and Easter, surprise, is coming up. Uh, so those are all there. Um, also, you notice our missionary of the month is Kalia. This is Kalia. She's going to be doing... She's going to be doing a missions moment with Dave in just a bit, filling you guys in on what's going on at COS there. Um, so yeah, that's everything in the bulletin today. We're going to do, I'm going to do our scripture reading now. So if you guys want to stand with me as we read God's word, we're going to be in Romans chapter eight. If you want to turn there with me. We like to begin our services with scripture reading, um, because we're coming to worship God. And so we want to get our hearts in the right place. We want to get our minds in the right place. So, um, we like to start off with some of God's word for that. So I'm going to be reading Romans 8, verses 1 through 11. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement, requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on the things of the spirit. Now the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. 
Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. Let's pray. Father, we gather together this morning to worship you. Lord, a lot of time we are tempted to, to worship ourselves, to prioritize ourselves, our wants, our desires, our needs. But Lord, that's living according to the flesh. Lord, we have been brought to new life because of your spirit. We have this life and this peace because of you, God. And it's our faith in you that gives us all this joy and this hope and this peace. Because you have done the thing we could not do. You've conquered sin and death. So God, I thank you for this morning that we can gather together to proclaim these things to one another. To remind each other of your greatness, your goodness, your love, your truth, Lord. That we were dead in sin, but you brought us to life because of Christ. Lord, I pray for this morning as, as we sing to you, as we hear from your word, as we worship you through giving, all these different things, as we get to hear about what's going on at COS, Lord, I pray that it all just brings glory to you. That this time together can remind us of who you are and it can help us cling to you today and this week as we go from here, that we can proclaim your excellencies, Lord. We pray this all in your name. Amen. I have never been known for my technological experience, except in the hospital. I do better there. Um, anyway, uh, Moment for Mission is always, we do it once a month, and I'm always excited for that month, we, the time when we get to do Moment for Mission, because it just gives our, our focus um, maybe a little bit more, just not on ourselves, but towards our community and towards the uh, rest of the world, although I think our church is very generous and does an awesome job. Um, but it is fun to celebrate our relationships with the church worldwide. And I'm always reminded, as we do, that in the book of Revelations, every tribe, every tongue, and every nation is going to be represented in heaven. So it's so excited for us to be able to be involved in that process. Um, every month, you may get tired of me doing it, but I'm going to continue to remind us, in the, in the pews in front of you, we have the handout of the missionaries we support. Um, those are made, as Susan holds it up, those are made to take home and to be a prayer trigger for you all. Um, um, also, same thing, the world watch list that we have are in the pew racks in front of you. Um, and they, we have 2022. We are going to have 2023, but take the 2022. They're great prayer triggers just to be reminding you of. We also monthly do the prayer force alert. That, again, is a daily prayer reminder for different countries and different parts of the world. And I encourage you just to have it in your Bible and to have it in your daily prayer time. And every week we have our bulletins that have our missionary of the month as well as a country to be praying for. And this month it's Kalia. Um, and the country that we're praying for is Eritrea. Um, one last thing. We all have a mission trip from our church going to? Belize. Belize. And we have pictures of the different missionaries, and I just randomly picked out Nathan Carter, okay? Not randomly. I picked out because, well, we love everyone, but Nathan uh, is a special guy, and his family is going. He and his, two of his daughters are going. It has their phone number on it. It's a prayer trigger. And for you guys, just to pick out, pick out a popsicle from everybody, and that you can be prayerfully supporting, um, financially supporting, and uh, a variety of other uh, ways to keep in touch. Um, the missionary of the month this month is pretty special. Uh, Kalia has, is one of our own. Um, that's pretty, pretty cool that we have someone who was partially at least raised in this church in this community, and, and many of us have had a, a role in her life, and she's had a role in many of our lives. So she comes up to share. It's just been amazing to watch her grow and flower and uh, just to be used by God in just such an amazing way.
well, it's always really exciting to be here. And uh, I usually say that when I go to churches. I'm like, it's so, it's so fun for me to be here. But it's always fun for me to be here because um, I get to hang out with all of you wonderful people. And so thanks for giving me an opportunity to share about all of the cool things that are going on at COS. Uh, for those of you who don't know or maybe have not even talked to me before, my name is Kalia Kaili, and I work with a nonprofit um, national organization called InterVarsity. Um, and I currently work up at College of the Siskiyous. And so I've been working there for about three years um, with students on campus to connect them in their faith and to connect them with their peers. And if I don't have my notes, I will literally talk for like 10 years. So let me just get this up. Uh, so there was a couple of things that I just felt were really fun things that I wanted to share with you. And one of those things was that I actually got to go on a global uh, missions, go to a global missions conference um, at the beginning of December. And that was really awesome. It's called Urbana. If you haven't heard of that, um, I would look it up. There are so many wonderful testimonies about people who have gone to Urbana and have just really done faith with the Lord um, and also just really realized their calling was for being a missionary um, overseas or even in their own backyard, which is what I get to do. Um, and so it just brought up a couple of things that I felt were important to share. Um, wherever you're at in your faith, wherever you're at with um, your calling, like maybe you're not sure how God is using you in the body, how he's using you in your community. Um, there's just a couple of encouragements that I want to share with you. God will make a way. If it's for you, God will make a way. And myself being included in that, um, I never thought that I would be a part of InterVarsity. And the way that God set that up was literally for me to a meeting. I had no idea I wasn't going to that meeting. And then here we are three years later. And so I just want you to know that um, whether it's finances, whether it's vision, whatever it is, if you trust it to the Lord, he'll make a way and he will provide. So everything that you need will be provided for. I just want you to know that by your support as a church, I have been able to receive uh, specific and intentional spiritual development. Um, I've gotten discipleship over the last two years and I've had training um, that has expanded my outreach among the campus and among uh, faculty on campus. And so uh, God is just providing in so many ways through your guys' support of me. I'm getting poured into as a leader. The campus is getting poured into. And then community members who get to come and join in on the fun of what God is doing at COS uh, are blessed as well. The third thing is, is God will reign. He gets the glory. Every single time he gets the glory. And what was so fun about getting to go to Urbana was just seeing the beauty of what God was doing in each individual life, that wherever they were at in their walk, God was using them for something. And in that, there's just a beauty. Um, there's just a beauty that we get to see, that we get to witness. And so I want to encourage you with those three things as you're considering, as you're listening, as you hear more about missions for... Mo <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> moment for missions as you hear about those things. Um, I encourage you to be reminded that God will provide, he will make a way, and he will reign. So some things that we're looking forward to in the spring, um, we have a once a week community dinner that happens on Tuesday nights. If you're available on a Tuesday night, please come have dinner with us. Whether you're a student, whether you're an adult, whether you work in the church, we want to have dinner with you and just come see what God is doing in the lives of students. Um, the second thing we're working on is a women's Bible study. Um, so we have a lot of interest on campus for young women who are just really invested in like getting deep into the word. And so we'll have a once a week on Wednesday, uh, a women's Bible study in the morning where college students will be able to just come dig into the word together and um, connect with their peers. The third thing that is like our focus, very big on my heart this semester is connecting with student athletes. So I don't know if you guys know what the population is at COS, but there's only 402 students who go to COS and 90% of those students are either dorm students or student athletes. And so uh, a big part of what we're doing in InterVarsity is outreach. Uh, within the student athlete teams, going to games, supporting by giving snacks, supporting by coming out and praying. Um, and that has been really fruitful to see how those connections and those relationships are growing across campus. So some tangible needs that we have coming up and just 
kind of consistently um, are meals. College students like to eat. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many times a week I hear some type of comment made about the cafeteria lunch or dinner. Um, and so it has been so joyful to get to invite people to come to a once a week dinner um, where we get to read the word together, we get to eat dinner together, we get to play games, we get to be in fellowship. And so that's been really fruitful and really enjoyable. And the third need that we have is for people to disciple. So if you're a male or a female and you are interested in discipling or connecting with young adults, I encourage you to get connected to me. Um, we could talk more about what that looks like. I've had several students in the last two weeks who are just really wanting to engage in their faith in a deep way. Um, so if that is something that calls to you, please come see me. I would love to talk to you more about how you can get involved. And the last thing... Um, our prayer request. How can you be praying about the campus? Um, what's really cool is like we can talk about missions and talk about all these wonderful things that are happening internationally. And sometimes that can leave us like questioning, like, what does that mean for me here? Who maybe I'm not able to travel nationally, internationally right now, or um, whatever, whatever the thought may be. Uh, we actually have a mission right in our backyard with COS being so close. And so I encourage you to be praying um, for student leaders. We are in a season, two-year colleges are really hard because you only get students for two years and then everybody kind of transfers out. And so we need more student leaders who are on fire for Jesus, um, who want to lead Bible studies and who want to connect with other students um, in their faith. And then the other thing would be for those student athletes. We have lots of student athletes who just need more community, need to be more connected. Um, and so we would like to have more opportunities to connect with those students as well. So if you could be praying for that. And then the dorm students. Um, dorm students are just having a really tough time. There are lots of changes that are happening at COS that are causing um, people to have to either move out or not being able to find housing, and that's been really tough. Um, and a lot of the time, they don't have transportation, so it's really tough for them to get outside into the community. And so if you could be praying, um, just that they would be drawn to what we're doing on campus and that we would have lots of fruitful conversations from that. And I'm pretty sure that I'm over time. <laughs> and so I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to encourage you that um, if you don't know much about InterVarsity, if you're not sure how you can help, please come see me. I am here most Sundays, um, and I'll be here after church, and you can come by and grab a contact card and get connected. So thank you. Okay, let's pray, y'all. God, again, we just do thank you for this day, and thank you for drawing us here, Lord, and thank you for just the ministry that's going on at COS, Lord. Thank you for Kalia. Thank you for the um, way she's pouring her lives into students and the way um, she has folks discipling her and pouring into her. God, we pray for Tuesday night dinner that you would bring many people. God, we um, are so excited about a women's Bible study starting and that you would just draw women to that, and it would just be a time of growth, Lord. God, and just again, the whole idea of connecting with student athletes, that um, that would just, doors would be wide open and many would, many would become involved and their lives would be changed, Lord. Both through the athletes and through the dorms, you would just uh, bring students to yourself. God, and that you would raise up um, folks from maybe um, different churches in our community that are willing to disciple, that are willing to meet with these college students and to just plug into their lives. God, we just lift all this up to you and know that you go before us and we're just so thankful for being here, Lord, and that we get to be involved in a mission right here in our backyard. God, we're just so thankful for that. Just fill Kalia with your spirit, guide her, give her wisdom, and just uh, center the people that you've guided her to and allow us to be involved in partnership. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you guys. I have, I have 10 minutes? I have 10 minutes. Thanks, Mike. You know who you're talking to. And I've been gone for six weeks, so I've got a lot, a lot of things to say, right? You know, I, I joked on Wednesday night, uh, it was nice to be here Wednesday night, and I got to teach for, for Hoyt uh, over the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, thanks, Hoyt, for giving me the topic of patience. Uh, but yeah, I think I got some of those jitters out, maybe, we'll see. It's like riding a bike. But uh, it's been good to be uh, back now and uh, amongst you and, and just seeing your smiling faces, and I just love you so much. And uh, it was a very productive sabbatical for, for me, and and uh, for my family, and I, I really appreciate your prayers, uh, just your even giving us space. I know some of you wanted to 
wanted to reach out and, and do that, and you held that, and we appreciate that. We we love you very much, though, and uh, are so so grateful to be back uh, with my church family. I think uh, there are a couple times my wife said, "Brandon, I'm I'm going to church. This is my church family. You go somewhere else." I'm like, "Oh, okay." So, uh, but it is great to be back here uh, today and uh, and to pick up uh, where we left off last week as Alistair. Uh, I was great. I was so thankful for Pastor Hoyt, Pastor Alistair, filling the gap uh, for the pulpit. Uh, as I was gone, they did a tremendous job, and I. I did keep up on uh, all of those sermons, and yeah, thank you guys for that. <clears throat> we, have, we have a fantastic church uh, with fantastic people, that's all of you, uh, who serve in, in many different capacities, and I am just so thankful uh, for you. And, uh, and as you go about your day, as you go about the, the day at the campus, uh, picking up your kids or, or seeing the workers that uh, are diligent with them, say, say thanks to them. Say thanks to your, your elders who are serving. Say thanks to your Sunday school teachers, your small group leaders. Uh, the people who put on our Wednesday night programs from uh, from dinner on, on up. So uh, just to be thankful for the, the varied gifts of God within our within our church. Uh, I'm not going to report today on, on the sabbatical and the revelations I have from God, and uh, that will be coming up soon, just of things that God has, has been teaching me. And really, I think the prayer, continued prayer, if I'd asked for, for this, would be this. Um, how do I take what God is personally doing in me and and temper that well and uh, and then shepherd that uh, into our church and let that be part of our church culture as well. So really that transition. I, I know that, that God is doing something in me and working through me, uh, but I also want to see us uh, thrive the way God wants us to thrive here as, at this body. So thank you for your prayers. I did want to mention, I, I mentioned to someone this, uh, this morning as we started gathering, in your bulletin on the inside right page at the bottom is a phone number. And I, I'm sure they've talked about this um, uh, a lot, but that phone number is a text phone number that you can, can text a, a prayer request to. So if you have something going on in your life, something's, some, a burden that you're like, I just wish someone knew or, or some, someone was praying for this and you don't know how to do that, just put that, save that number in your cell phone, right? FBC Church uh, Prayer Chain. And, and you can text that number. Let us know, you know if, you want, if you want someone to contact you, that's fine. But otherwise, we'll make sure that gets to our prayer team, that our staff will be praying for you, our elders, um, and all, all of those who are on the prayer chain will be praying for you and your needs. So make sure you, you check that out um, or save that in your phone if you have not already done that. All right, well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5, if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab a Bible out of the pew rack right there in front of you. It's good to have the sword as we look to the Word of God to let it transform us. It is living and active. Um, we are uh, back in our series, Written So That You May Believe. I know Alistair had talked about it a few weeks ago when he started preaching. He said, you know, it's been over a year, or almost a year to the date since he last preached, and I know we will remedy that, Alistair. We'll make sure we get you on, on there. But I looked back to the last time I preached in this series, and it, was, it had been over a year since, since I had been there preaching in that, so uh, neat to come back to that and to, to revisit. And it is one of those ongoing series, uh, similar to the Psalms, uh, as we go through the summer in the Psalms, that will probably take several years to get through, but it's great to be back uh, in, in this series called Written So That You May Believe, and it is a harmony of the gospel, right? It's, it's the, uh, the, the gospel accounts. And, and through this series, series, I really think it's important for us to realize and understand um, we don't come to the gospels in this series as we, as we try to harmonize what Jesus taught and what he did. We don't come to it just for information, right? I, I'm a history buff, so sometimes I come to things for that purpose. Like, I want to I know what happened and how it happened. But what's really important is not only to know what happened and, and how it happened and maybe why it happened, right? But to what? To, to figure out how can we apply that to our lives? Like history classes are taught in, in, in our country, they should be taught right and anywhere, that we don't repeat mistakes from the past, right? Uh, the same is true as we go to the scriptures. We see the life of Jesus and we shouldn't say, oh, that was really neat, Jesus. We should say, wow, look at what Jesus did and what he taught. How does that apply to me? So we don't go to the gospels. We don't go to the word of God for information only, but we go to the God for transformation, that you and I would be transformed. Now, Alistair, in the last few sermons, has covered uh, a few things about Jesus. Um, right before his started, we left off last time, we, over a year ago, with the, the right Messiah, that Jesus was the right Messiah for the time and for, uh, for all, of, all of time, for all of eternity, and to fulfill the law. Uh, and then as Alistair prepared and preached his sermons, uh, he went into Jesus showing himself as this right Messiah, confirming uh, he is and, and uh, who God sent him to be. Uh, that Christ wa was made uh, was one who can make the unclean clean. That's what Jesus does. He makes the unclean clean. Right? Any of you out there unclean? Right? Only a couple. Yeah. We're all unclean. Right? Jesus makes us clean. 
The Messiah can do that. And, and, and further, he talked about how um, he, he healed the, the paralytic, right? But he didn't just heal the paralytic. He forgave the sins through the paralytic's faith and through his friend's faith. Right? This is a Savior who doesn't just come to heal, but he comes to forgive. And really, that's the, the crux of our healing, right? Uh, our ailments, our, our physical um, issues, will, will, if they're healed, will come back again, right? At some point, this body will wear out and die. But ultimately, Jesus knows what we really need, and that is the forgiveness of our sin. And he's the one that can do that. Now, all the while, this is the right Messiah. And as the right Messiah comes, the wrong people, the wrong teachers are like, I don't like this. He's ruffling our feathers. I'm not, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. So he's going to get a lot of flack. And ultimately, they're going to begin conspiring against Jesus. We'll see in the next few weeks uh, as we preach through this, this te- uh, the text. We'll see how they come against Christ. So Alistair talked about making the unclean clean. He talked about uh, Jesus healing uh, and forgiving the sins of the paralytic. And then last week, we saw the call to Levi right, who was a tax collector, despised. Whether he was an honest tax collector or not, it doesn't matter. He was despised by everybody. And for, for Jesus to talk to him, to call him out, and then for, for Matthew, Levi, Matthew now, to respond in faith saying, yes, I'm going to follow Jesus, and then to go to a banquet where he throws a party and invites all of his sinner friends, all, all, every, all the religious leaders, even the disciples, are looking like, what is going on? This, isn't, this is just outside of the norm. He's He's taking these, these things that we would consider right and wrong, and he's just throwing them on their head. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's doing. So we need to learn from this, right? See, he, he saw through who Levi was or who, who he was viewed to be, and he was willing to forgive and, and to bring him into the kingdom of God. And what, what a Savior we have. So for you and I who are like, who are like Matthew, or Levi's, who maybe were despised by people, maybe we were thought to be unclean or were thought to be sinners. Isn't it amazing that we have a, a gracious Messiah who's willing to, to call us out of our sin and, and forgive us our sin and invite us into fellowship and relationship with him? Isn't that more than a story? Isn't that more than information? Right? That's something that leads to transformation. And So today, as we continue on in this story, and actually I, I believe very strongly that this is tied together. It's almost like within one breath of what was happening last week as, as uh, Levi was called. But today we're going to see him clarify. Jesus is going to clarify the gospel message and he's going to continue just to shake things up. So we're going to look at uh, Luke 5 here in a minute, but let's, let's pray and then we'll get to, get to Luke 5. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. God, as we look to your word today, we, we ask that, God, you would help us receive it. God, it is living and active, and, but God, we can reject it. We can harden our hearts to your spirit. God, open our hearts. God, our, our desire is that we put you in the proper place today. That you are God and we are not. That we've elevated you and we've humbled ourselves so we might hear from you and be forever changed. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. That all who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God, we ask today that we would not look to your text look to the scriptures, look to the word of God as just information, but we would let it be applied to our lives as transformation. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 27, which uh, Alistair covered last week. We're going to read through uh, 39 together. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. He said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Then Levi hosted a, a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and, and others who were guests with them, but the Pharisees and the scribes were complaining to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then they said to him, John's disciples fast often and say prayers. And those of the Pharisees, they do the same. But yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, You can't make the wedding guests fast while the groom is with them, can you? But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also 
the piece from the new garment will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, it will spill, and the skins will be ruined. No, new wine is put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new because he says, the old is better. This is the Word of God. Today we're going to look at this passage and, and break it up into uh, the, the theme is the right gospel. Right? And part of this is for you and I to have the right perspective, and Jesus wants us to have the right perspective on what he's come to do and how that's going to be accomplished. And I, the reason I, I tied in and read uh, the call of Levi, because right at the end of the call of Levi, uh, you see something there. You see, first of all, this, this great feast Right, happening after Levi was called, after Matthew was called and invited into, into the kingdom of, of God and, and to be a disciple of Jesus. There's this party that's thrown. And, and those that are watching, and oftentimes you'll see in the scriptures, there are, are different groups of people, right? There's Jesus, who's the Messiah, and then there's the, the religious elites or teachers of the day who often you know, kind of look, look from the corner, scowling at what Jesus is doing, not wanting to, to give any authority to him. Right, then you have the others who are maybe in the middle who are like, well, we kind of want to follow what these teachers, religious teachers are saying, but we're not really sure. This is kind of interesting what's happening over here. And then you have just sinners. People who are like, we have no chance at all. We're just, we're worth, worthless in society. We, we're unclean. No one wants to touch us or be with us. And everyone just pushes us away. So this new religious thing is totally blowing our mind. And they're, and they're a little more hungry for what Jesus has to say because the religious teachers don't like it. Right, so there's this. That's kind of who's around typically uh, in these in these stories or parables or in the teachings of Christ. But but you see that there's this party being thrown, and and if if you look at your outline, number one, let's let's talk about number one. The right gospel, number one, is a joyful solution to the real problem. The right gospel, right, the true gospel, is a joyful solution to the real problem. Now we've seen Jesus already address the real problem, right? Not only did he heal the paralytic, what else did he say? Your sins are forgiven. And that's one of those things that would rile up anybody that, wait a minute, you can't forgive sins. Only God forgives sins. And Jesus is like, "Mm mm-hmm. That's right, only God can forgive sins. Your sins are forgiven. And they don't like that, right? They, They have these traditions. They have these ways set in place that this is how we do things. If you want your sins forgiven, this is what it needs to look like. And so it went on, and, and there's this party being thrown, and uh, we see Jesus reply, because he asked, why are you eating with sinners? And Jesus responds, he, they asked the disciples of Christ, and they're probably like, I'm not really sure. I just know he loved me and called me, so I kind of like it. And Jesus knows their hearts, and he responds. He says, it's not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Right? It's, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, we have to understand, and Alistair did a good job of this, that we see that there's a difference here. He's not actually saying that the Pharisees aren't sick. He's not actually saying that the Pharisees are righteous. They are sick people who aren't going to the hospital. Right? The sick who need a doctor, where do they end up? At the doctor. Right? The sick who want to pretend they don't have anything wrong, where do they end up? In the grave, not at the doctor, right? The, the, the righteous, right? And Jesus constantly calls them the righteous. They're actually the self-righteous. They're, they self-proclaim as we're righteous. Jesus is like, I can't, I can't speak to you. I can't speak to your heart because you think you have it all together. I have not come to call those who think they're righteous. I've come to call sinners. People who actually know that there's a problem between them and God. I've come to call them, and what, what did he say he come to call them? To, to something. He didn't name them something, he called them to something. What is it? To repentance. He called them to repentance. So he didn't say, I've come to call the sinners my children. I've come to call sinners to repent of their sin and turn to me in faith, and then they'll be part of my kingdom and be my children. He, he said, I've come to call them. Repent, turn away from your old ways, turn away from your religion. Now, it gets really dicey here because as he goes in to describe the the garment and the wineskins and talk about the banquet, he is really putting a lot of, or casting a lot of doubt on the religious systems of the day, which which these people who are in high power don't like at all, right? 
But the, he says, I've come to call sinners to repentance. And then in verse 33, then they said to him. Now, now there's lots of accounts here. There's three accounts in the Gospels of this story. And it's, it's hard to say. Is it, was it John's disciples who asked him? Was it the Pharisees that asked him? Was it uh, maybe disciples of the Pharisees? Or it says people came and asked him. Uh, whoever, I think all of them had the question. They're wondering about this. Because Jesus has said something. You've come to call people to repentance. Like, well, that brings up a question, Jesus. Because we practice repentance. They, and they practiced it for show. And so he said, you know, John's disciples, they fast uh, and, and uh, often, and they, and they say prayers. They fast and say prayers. It was interesting when they accosted Jesus, because John was, John was the baptizer, right? John the baptizer. He came and made the way for Christ. He was the one who pointed to Jesus and said, hey, look who's coming. He's greater than I am. He's the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So when the question comes up, oh, let's talk about John's disciples. Obviously, Jesus, you have to agree with them, and they agree with you. And so they brought up John's disciples, right? They fast often and they say prayers. And those of the Pharisees do the same thing, but yours eat and drink. It was kind of one of those traps, wasn't it? You ever hear that? Like, like if your enemy and your friends say the same thing, it's probably the truth. Like you're, most time your enemies are against you, your friends are for you. But if your enemies and your friends are saying the same thing, it's probably a good thing. Like you better take, pay, pay attention to what they're saying. In this case, it's like, hey, John's disciples, your friends, and the Pharisees, your enemies, they both practice this. They both do this. And, and here's why. And here's why they brought this up. Jesus says, I've come to call sinners to repentance. The tradition of fasting was to mourn over your sin. And, and actually, it was, it was commanded uh, one time in the Old Testament. It was commanded to, to practice uh, on and around the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, where, where, you, where the Day of Atonement, and the priest would come and they would make the sacrifice for themselves sacrifice for the people. They'd, they'd kill a goat and then they'd spread, the, spread blood on another goat and let the goat run away with our sins and they'd run off in the hills and our sins would be forgiven for the year. Like, yes! Finally, but you come to it in somber humility saying, I'm going to fast. I'm going to seek God. I'm going I'm to lower myself. It's deep humility that I'm going to practice right here. In fact, we see it in Leviticus 16. He says this, uh, this is to be a permanent statue for you in the seventh month and on the tenth day of that month, you are to practice self-denial. This is the fast. And do no work, both the native and the alien who resides among you. Atonement will be made for you on this day to cleanse you, and you will be clean from your sins before the Lord. It is the Sabbath of complete rest for you. And you must practice this self-denial, this fasting. It is a permanent statute. This is that day of atonement. This is what they knew. And, and from that, they, they picked up the practice and, and made it a tradition. And the tradition of the Pharisees was Mondays and Thursdays, man, we're going to fast. Mondays and Thursdays. It wasn't your typical 24-hour fast. It was like a sun, sun up to sundown fast. So you got up early enough before the light was there, you could have a big breakfast. And then you start fasting all day long, seeking, the God, seeking God. And then uh, when the light went down, the sun went down, you could eat again. It's interesting to think about, though. Uh, most of these Pharisees were, were very much about themselves in the sh and, and for show. So the tradition, interestingly enough, they fasted in the light and they ate in the dark. You see the dilemma there? It, it, to me, it's kind of a telling thing of their heart. Let's talk about this idea of this practice of self-denial. It was, it was an idea of being totally occupied with being lowly or, or in a weakened state. And it was the only instance of fasting commanded in the Old Testament. Now, there are several other instances where there are examples uh, in the Old Testament. However, they are, uh, they are spontaneous and they had to do with uh, grieving or, or mourning, or, or really humbly seeking God's face and, and trying to rid yourself of the distraction that would cause you to not see him. But again, the Pharisees made this a, a practice and tradition. They, were the, they, were, they made it a practice and tradition so they could be self-satisfying. They, they would satisfy themselves with this fast. And then you see the disciples. What were they doing? So they had this tradition of fasting, even John, they picked it up, and, and it was, it was for them, it was, this is a sign of our repentance, the sign of our, our, our humility, our pride. Let me actually put it on a banner for you so you all can see how humble I am. That's, and Jesus accosted them, right? But Jesus' people, they were, they were eating and drinking and being merry. But here's, here's why. Jesus, for, for the disciples of Christ, Jesus was the realization of what they had hoped for what they had prayed for. He was the realization of what, what they had fasted for. He was the once and done final sacrifice. And, and 
He was there. He was there. It wasn't, I hope you'll come soon. It, he's there in their midst. So what did he say to them? He said, you, you can't make the wedding guest fast while the groom is with them, can you? He's like, the wedding's happening. You're not going to a wedding. You're like, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fasting today. I'm not going to celebrate. I, I need to get my somber face on. No, you can't do that. He said there will be a time when, when the groom will be taken away from them. And this is amazing. This is a, a Christological statement he makes. And what he says is, is there will be a time. Where he's like, nope, I'm not going to go rule as king on the throne right now. I am here to give my life as a ransom for many. And there will be a time when I am crucified, when I am killed, when I am taken away. And then you'll be somber. And then you'll be somber. The, the, the disciples of Christ knew something different. He, he was there in their midst, and they were full of joy. That's why we talk about the right gospel being a joyful solution to the real need. When we understand our, our sins can be forgiven, not just because we did it one time a year at Yom Kippur at the Day of Atonement, but because Christ came to give himself as a ransom for many for, forever, he's in your midst, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I want to celebrate the Lamb of God right in front of me. And that's what they did. The author of Hebrews says this, this is the kind of high priest we need. Talking about Jesus. Holy and innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, for their, first for their own sins and then for the people. He did it. Talking about Jesus. He did it once for all time when he offered himself. And this is why we rejoice. This is why Jesus is the joyful solution to what we really need, to the real problem. He's the forgiver of our sins who once and done did it. This doom and distress and gloom was replaced through Christ with hope and with joy. So what does fasting now look like? You know, we have a fasting and prayer service once a month at the beginning of the month. And, and I wrote down a couple things I think fasting is, is used for now. One, it's used for show. Right? And Jesus spoke against that. In fact, here's what he says in Matthew 6. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting is obvious to people. Oh, I'm, I'm so hungry today. I'm, I'm just so weak. I, sorry, I, I lost concentration. I'm fasting for the Lord. No, you don't do that. Fasting should not be for show. For some, it is. He says, truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you fast, and I want us to understand, there is no clear command in the New Testament anywhere for us to fast. But there are lots of models and examples. And there are lots of wins, not ifs, in the New Testament. So there are models for us to follow. So when, he says, when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Like, get that good moisturizing cream. Make sure you're, you look vibrant and healthy. So your fasting isn't obvious to others, but your father, to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret, he will reward you right there should be a joy we have in in, in seeking the lord and and the, actually tradition would even say that a lot, some people in in early the early church stopped fasting altogether why because they the lord was they knew the lord was still with them even though he had come he had died he had risen from the dead and ascended to the father what did he, who did he send his spirit was there he said go and make disciples and i'm with you always they're like hey joy and happiness all the time it's a party all the time with Jesus. There's no gloominess here, right? But also there were traditions of the early church. That they said, no, we're going to fast. We're going we're to commit someone to the Lord through fasting and prayer. We're going to, to seek the Lord ourselves. And I, and I think, yeah, we, we do have the Spirit indwelling us. But we can ignore the Spirit indwelling us often, more often than we could when Jesus was right there with them, right? Because when Jesus was present, it was, it was hard to ignore Jesus being right there. But when Jesus ascended to the Father and sent the Spirit... We have all kinds of distractions around us that will, that will interfere with that, don't we? We have all kinds of those distractions. And, and, and we need to say, I need to, I need to quiet myself from the things I'm busy on. I need to work to, to seek the Lord. That's, that's part of what I've been working on in my sabbatical. Silence and solitude. Wanting to, to clutter, declutter my mind with the, all the information ping-ponging around in my head so I can stop and pray and stop and think about the Lord and focus on Him. That's, that's so important for us to do. Again, this is not commanded, but it is modeled and set in as, as, as an example. We see it there. Jesus says, when you fast, Acts chapter 13, as they were worshiping, 
not if, but as they were worshiping uh, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. A clear model there of fasting. But we're depriving ourselves. We're saying, I want, to, I want me to empty and, and be gone. I want to be empty so when I'm empty, I can be hungry and thirsty for more of Jesus and to hear and be sensitive to the Spirit of God. Uh, Acts chapter 14, we see that when, not if, but when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord uh, in whom they had believed. So we see that, that the right gospel is a joyful solution to the real problem. Right? And, and while, while we have Jesus, it's a party, and we know that that is, is a, a foreshadowing, a taste of the things to come in the kingdom of God. And now while he's not here, we don't do it for public show or recognition, but we do it in order to set ourselves apart, to quiet our soul, to empty ourselves so we can hunger and thirst for more of him. This is the right gospel, not a public display of look how great I am. That is an affront to the spiritual leaders. Number two, the right gospel we see here, it cannot be a patch to the old covenant. The right gospel cannot just be a patch to the old covenant. So Jesus gets done telling them, uh, listen, there will be a day when you fast in those days. And then he says, let me tell you this parable. He says, no one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, the, the, uh, not only will it, uh, he tear the new one, but also the piece from the, old, uh, from the new garment will not match the old. Uh, other, other accounts of this, uh, the way they said it, is that you're taking this brand new, unlaundered patch First of all, you're taking a brand new patch off a brand new garment. Why would you ruin a new garment for the sake of the old tattered one? Listen, I have some old tattered clothes. I call them my work clothes, right? It's usually like some Crocs and some camo pants and a plaid old shirt. I know the fashion statement's huge, isn't it? It's amazing. But I love it. There's a shirt I really love, and I just like about a month ago finally threw it in the garbage. When you look at it, like there is just no hope for this anymore, and I wanted there to be hope for it. But I couldn't see myself. And it's hard because I'm like, well, I don't want to wear a, a new work shirt, right? And that's my mentality. I, the old one's still okay. We'll just patch it up. And it, it just doesn't work. Uh, in, in this system, you see the religious leaders have their old framework, this old covenant. Like, this is what's good and right. This is our religious system. It works. We want it. And, and it kind of went two different directions. One was from the Pharisees. They held tightly to the old covenant, and they were okay with maybe Jesus helping them modify or reform Judaism with some new. And they're wondering, maybe he can help us out a little bit. So they're asking, they're inquiring, or, or maybe some of them are just not really wanting it at all. They wanted to hold on to the old. Any of you here? Huh? Want to hold on to the old things? Yeah. Now, John's disciples, they were kind of in a different camp. They're like, hey, Jesus is here. He's new. It's new covenant. We, are, we are, have a new spirit amongst us. We, we want new, new, new. But they're like, so they're holding on tightly to the new, but they're asking, can we, can we have a little bit of the old mixed in too? Can, can we put, take the new and can we put it in something old for tradition's sake, right? That's what, so there's kind of two different directions, but really they're saying, can we just have the new mix with the old? And Jesus addresses this. No one tears a patch. No one puts a patch on an old garment from a new one. And because it's going to tear away and the old garment's still going to be wore, worn out and torn and the new garment now is going to be ruined and it will not match, that, that patch won't match the, the new or the old. Uh, Christ did not come to merely reform an old, worn out system, but instead to introduce something new. You know, we talk about garments. It's interesting because it's talking about a wedding, right? You're with the, the groom. It's a wedding. You got to eat. And then usually a garment, like you wore the best clothes you could at this wedding. So he's kind of keeping in, in this picture as well of, hey, garments are to be new and radiant and awesome. And, and brides get dressed up for these things. And grooms get dressed up for these things. And the wedding party gets dressed up for these things. Right? The garment. But gar in Scripture, we see garment or being clothed with, with some analogies. Um, it helps us to, to see maybe a standing you might have in society. Like, look at how amazing that garment is like the pharisees they wore some pretty pretty elaborate stuff to say look how great i am right of course no one should outdo the bride on her wedding day that needs to be the, the best garment but also gar uh, clothing was or garment was was shown as a, a a type of character like when you're clothed in a certain way uh paul says clothe yourselves what with humility and compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience he says clothe ourselves with that there's a character trait also that goes along with this 
clothing. Again, they liked the outward idea of clothing. Jesus was like, no, you, you can't hold on to the old clothes. You have to have new. Isaiah 61.10 says, rejoice, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exalt my God, for He has clothed me with the garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. Here's that garment, that righteous new character coming from our God. He said, just as a groom wears a turban, as a bride adorns herself with jewels, as beautiful and new and radiant as they look with the garments they're clothed in, you and I are to look that way through what God is giving us through Christ. We see this in, in Luke 15. There's a, the story of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son takes his wealth and leaves and squanders it, and he's in the, in the fields eating the pods of the leftovers of the pigs, and, he, and it says he comes to his senses. He makes a realization about something. And, and I want us to, to understand there's, there's a really interesting thing here. He says, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my father, because I know how he's treat, he treats his, his hired men. And I'm going to go, God, I, I, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. I will just do the work and fabricate whatever I need to fabricate. I, I, I know that's what you want of me, and you'll treat me well. And, and it's interesting that he leaves something out when he comes back to his father. He comes back, he says, uh, Father, I've sinned against uh, heaven and against you or in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he stops. He realizes something. He, he, it's not about just performance and duty and looking the part. There's a new relationship he has. You know why? Because the father says while he was a long way off, the father ran to him. The father, in this shameful, shameful way, was watching for him day in and day out. And when he saw him a long way off, he hiked up his, the skirt of his, his robe and he started running across town. And all these Jewish men are like, oh my goodness, how, how dare he? How could he do that? That's so shameful. He should go out there and, and cast his son out. But what does he do? The son came to his senses. And the son, when he said to his father, I, I, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, we'll stop right there. He knew. It's like, I'm not worthy. I'm just not worthy. I need, I need to be new. And you're here making me new. And here's what the father said. He told the servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. We need new clothes. He didn't say, hey, let's go launder what he has on now. Let's go fix the tears and all the things inside of what he has now. He said, bring out the new robe. This, you're done with this. Put on a new robe on him. Uh, and he says, uh, put on a ring on his uh, finger and sandals on his feet. And then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Why? Because this son of mine was dead and is alive. Right? He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You see, there's a celebration that God wants to have. When we look at the right gospel, we look at the right gospel, it, it cannot be something that's just patched together with old ways. The right gospel is that you and I come to our senses realizing that the old ways are worth nothing. And the Father is standing there watching for us, waiting for us, calling to us, wanting to clothe us in His righteousness. To make us a son and a daughter of the Most High God. That's, that's who He is. That's the right gospel. And these Judaizers are like, but I like all this other stuff. I like the old way so much more. I need that. Paul, Paul used to be like that, right? When he was Saul, he was an extreme persecutor of the church, but he was one of the most perfect examples of a religious elite. And he has a, a resume that would blow your minds and blow the minds of most Pharisees and, and scribes. But here's what he said about that stuff. Here's what he said about the old garment. Philippians 3. This is everything that was a gain to me, my old garment, my old ways. And by the way, if you looked at Paul in his old ways, you would not see an old garment. You would see him probably pressed perfectly. It's like everything starched, everything lined up perfectly. It was, it was like, wow, you, you're looking awesome. But he says all of that was old. He says, what I thought was gain to me, I've considered a loss because of Christ. More than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of Him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so I might gain Christ. The real gospel puts Christ right in front of us and says, come and embrace Christ. Leave behind yourself. Leave behind your stuff. Count it as loss. He says, I, I wanted to be found in, that I might gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own from the law. And Paul was one who did. If, you, if anyone was considered righteous, Paul was considered righteous. He had done everything right. He was born in the right place, did the right studies. He was perfect. But he was nothing without Jesus. He knew that old garment would count for nothing. 
And he needed to have a righteousness, not of his own, but one uh, through faith in Christ. He says the righteousness from God is based on faith. And we say, well, well, it's, it's what we've always done. Maybe that's you. You know, this isn't just a story or information about some, some religious leaders from one day. This is about you and I. What religious systems are you clinging to? What conversations are you and I having with our friends out in the community who are lost as all get out, but they say, they say the right Jesus thing? Like, oh yeah, I, I did this, and then, yeah, it was, Jesus is really, it's really great to know, you know, think about Jesus. And they're like, yeah, and you, and you say, yeah, you're right, it's so good, isn't it? No, it's not. What you're saying is, yeah, that patch of Jesus you have, that little decal sticker you put in your water bottle, that's enough. Just keep on keeping on. It's not. It is worthless. Everything that we would consider as gain that is not Jesus is not gain and should be lost. Every old garment or old tradition that we thought was this is the right way to do it, it Jesus says, no, it's, it's me. It's all about me. The author of Hebrews, he says this, uh, for uh, if that first covenant had been faultless, like, hey, if what you were doing, that old garment was truly great, there would have been no occasion for the second. No reason for the new. But finding fault with his people, God says, see, the days are coming, says the, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors. And he goes on in verse 12. He says, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. But here's the difference between these covenants. The old covenant, the old gar garment was to be a faith-filled sacrifice. That, that they were to practice faith. It was, it was the sacrifice, if not given in faith, would count for nothing. And I, and I can't even imagine how many actual sacrifices counted for nothing. Because how many of us in that system like to just revert to checking off the box? Oh, we did, we did the work. We put in the time. It, it's all we needed to do. We're good. It was a faith-filled, it should have been a faith-filled sacrifice. But today, what does the new covenant offer? It's faith in his sacrifice. Faith in his sacrifice. It's still based on faith. Righteousness has always been based on faith. It's credited to us as righteous once we show faith, what the Scripture tells us. He goes on and says, by, by saying a new covenant, he's declared the first one obsolete. Obsolete. Now this, this is something that's going to shake up, and it's shaking up all of those who follow the old one. All those who, who insist on the old one. All of those who find power and esteem and, and worth through the old one. No, it's, it's not the old one. It's, it's obsolete. It's, it says, and what is obsolete? is growing old and is about to pass away. It doesn't mean if you're old, you're about to pass away and, and what you have is to offer is, is worthless. No, it means whatever system that you're relying on for salvation outside of Christ is going to die and fail you. Only Jesus is the true answer. Only Jesus is the true way. He is the truth. So what was faulty about the old? One was this. It was never finished. What was faulty about the Old Covenant? It was never finished. Every priest stands day after day ministering and offering the same sacrifices time and time again, which can never take away sins. This is Hebrews chapter 10. But this man, Jesus, after offering one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Oh, it's done. It's finished. The old, old one wasn't. Every year you'd come back. Every year you better, better be there in faith offering a sacrifice to God. It was never finished. Number two, what was faulty about the old? It produced a faith struggle between legalism and shame. This is, this is why so often he comes in and says, what you're doing counts for nothing. There's no, you're not doing it by faith. Right? If you go to the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see people who lived a life of faith, who, who obeyed and worked and did things based on faith. And it was credited to them as righteousness. But when you get so deep into that, you, you, you have two ways you end up going. If you don't stay right in faith, you end up in two different ways. And this the struggle is real. One is this, legalism. If I just put in my time, if I just pay my dues, if I just check off all the right boxes and have all the right things worked out, God will certainly accept me, right? The problem with that is, is that if it's not done in faith, that will lead to um, a self-righteous attitude, and ultimately a realization that what? 
I can't really do this. I, I can't be what God wants me to be. I can't perfectly fulfill and follow all of these things that he wants me to follow. And, and here's where that leads. If you're not right in faith and trusting in faith and, and sacrificing in faith, you have this legalistic place where you're, oh, I'm self-righteous, and then I, then I count myself as so, as, as, as so hard, I, I can't even do it anymore. Now I'm in this place of shame. And when people get to a place of shame, what ends up happening is they just give up altogether. See, I can, I can never do it. I can never live up to it. I'm out of here. Peace. That's what they do. And if you and I are living in places of self-righteousness where we're trying to check off all the boxes and be good enough and be perfect enough and look the right part and say the right things, you are heading down the wrong road. And it will be worth absolutely nothing when you see Jesus face to face. Because he's going to ask you, where was your faith? Why were you clinging so much to the old when I was right there to give you life and to clothe you with my righteousness, a righteousness you could never achieve or never accomplish on your own, but one I would give you through faith in Christ? On the other end, maybe you're hearing like, well, I just, I just can't ever live up. I can't ever be like so-and-so or such and such. I just can't do it. You're right, you can't. But guess what? Jesus did it for you. The Hebrews author says this in 12. Uh, we have this large cloud of witnesses talking about Hebrews 11. Therefore, we lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And I would call those things those legalistic battles we have, those, those uh, trying, to, trying to accomplish everything we need to accomplish. We set those aside. He says, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. It says, for the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. And guess what he did when he endured the cross? He endured the cross despising the shame. If you feel ashamed, guess what? Jesus died for you and despised the shame. He despised the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God saying, I accomplished it. I did it. If you come to me, I am the gracious Father who will run out to you and greet you with a kiss and wrap you in my arms and my robe of righteousness and you will never be the same again. People, this is not information. This is about transformation. Whoa, this, is, this is about things being written down for you and I, right? Written so that what? We would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing that we would have what? Life in his name. And that leads us to the final point, number three. The right gospel, the right gospel makes all things new. The right gospel makes all things new. I, before we get into this, I... I Listen, there are a lot of amazing traditions in our past heritage. I, I think a, a, one of your ladies' groups has gone through the feasts, right, of Israel. Amazing. And, and the imagery is amazing of Christ. But those things should not be done and practiced on their own just because as, as a tradition. They should be things that are practiced because they all point us to Jesus, the Savior, who has done it all for us. And we enjoy Christ with those things. So it's not that we can't have and enjoy those old traditions. But they, they on their own mean nothing and Jesus makes all things new. It's about Jesus. The last part of this chapter 5 of Luke, 37 to 39. He said, No one puts wine into, or new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. It will spill and the skins will be ruined. No, new wine is put into fresh wineskins. I, I, I want you to think about this. There's a, a process. They would bring an animal skin of some, some uh, type that hasn't been stretched out yet. It's not totally cured. They'd put their new wine in it, and the new wine would what? Ferment and release gases and stretch that skin out and stretch that skin out, and then you'd have wine, and then you'd dump it into your barrels, and you'd get to enjoy it at your wedding feast, and then they'd have these skins that have already been stretched. And, and what's going to happen? He says, listen, you have these old stretched skins. What don't you do with them? Think, don't think they're going to stretch again. Don't try to put new wine in those and say, hey, we, we really liked this skin. This is my favorite wine skin. I'm going to put new wine into this, and it's going to be awesome. He says, no, you're, you're going to do that, and it's going to ferment. It's going to start to expand, and it's already expanded. And this brittle skin is going to tear and rip, explode, whatever you want to call it. And it'll be ruined, and the wine will be ruined now. Look what you've done. You spilled all the wine. This is the struggle, right? This is kind of what the disciples of John were thinking. Like, hey, we, we love the new. We want the new. But can't we put it in the old? Can't we, can't we put it here? And Jesus is like, no, you can't do that. Don't, don't settle for the old wineskins 
And he goes further, he says, don't, and don't settle for the old wine. Now, I know that's kind of a, a conundrum, isn't it? It's like, well, you think the older the wine gets, the better it is, right? That's not really what he's talking about. What he's saying in, in the last part of this verse, he says, uh, and no one after drinking old wine wants new, because he says the old is better. W- what does it mean? It means this, I like what I like, don't change it up on me, Jesus. I'm happy with the old, I'm happy with the routine, I'm happy with the way we've been doing it forever. There will be many times in our lives when, when followers of Christ will be tempted to think that, that their way or the old way of living is better. This is how we've always done it. This is how we used to do it. That doesn't make it right. Jesus has made all things new. And we're to throw off the old, crucifying our flesh and taking up our cross and following Him. 2 Corinthians tells us that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see the new has come. The new has come. So not only was this a once and done sacrifice, to all who would believe, available for anyone who would believe. This was also a promise. This wine, this new wine was also a promise of the indwelling Spirit of God in us. And and, and he's, he's sending his Spirit to indwell the believer, the person who has been transformed through faith in Jesus Christ. He's not sending his Spirit to to pour out into the old wineskins. He's sending his Spirit out to convict those who are holding on to the old wineskins. And he sent his spirit out to convict us so we would repent of that and throw off the old and let him make all things new. So this wineskin and wine is a battle between our flesh and the spirit. Alistair read some of this from Romans earlier. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Listen, there is a freedom That's why we can have real joy. and That's why we can eat and be merry with the Savior because of what He's done for us. He's made all things new. For what the law could not do. Man, we hold on to things that just don't produce, right? That just don't work for us. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, the old way, but according to the Spirit, the new. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. This is about the Spirit of God. On uh, Wednesday night, we we talked about patience. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Boy, it's teaching through those. And one of the things that stood out to me as I prepared for that and then prepared for this was, was the difference between what a fruit looks like and what a work looks like. And I mentioned this to the few that were there on Wednesday night, but, but a work, like I, I, could, I, I could just hold my tongue in line at the DMV, right? And, and my heart could still be like so sour against the DMV or so sour by the people in front. Like you didn't pick a, pick a number, you didn't sit down. You, I mean, we could just go on and on, right? But see, that, that kind of quote unquote air quotes patience, right? Is not character patience. That's just biting your tongue and fabricating patience. Listen, you and I are very good at fabricating obedience. You and I are very good at fabricating what looks like uh, obedience to Christ or looks like faith. But the real thing comes from inside. When the Spirit of God makes everything new and starts to produce a fruit. A fruit cannot be punched out in a factory by a machine. A fruit cannot be fabricated. A fruit... And the fruit of the Spirit comes from life within us and grows out of that life. And guess what fruit does? It makes more fruit. So for you and I, as we look at this and we say, yeah, I, I want this new life, it, it is about the depths and recesses of our heart being yielded to God's Spirit, the new wine He's pouring into us. Then God, I want the new. I want to forsake the old and I want to be attentive to what you have to say to me. The new life of the Holy Spirit indwelling us cannot be forced in the old wineskins of Judaism. Jesus is to be the cornerstone, and we are to be rooted and built up in Him alone. The things of the ceremonial law, the traditions, that were, were, they were all fulfilled by Jesus Christ for us. Now there's no need for sacrifices or priests or temples or ceremonies. 
Christ has taken care of that once and for all. Paul writes this, he says, about the Spirit. He says, you think about describing this work. He says, it's not about the, what's written down by ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It's not about what's on the tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human heart, because the new wine of the Spirit of God is on us. He says, there is a confidence that we have through Christ before God. It is not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. He has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Listen, you and I need to stop treating Jesus as a patch to fix our old way or, or force His newness into my old box that it's not intended to fit into. We need to let Him make all things new. These are written that you and I might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in real faith, believing, we would have life in His name. Amen? Let's stand together and pray. Father, I, I thank You so much for how much You love us. God, I thank You for Your Word, that it is living and active, and, and God, that, that it, is, it is something that convicts us from the core. God, may we yield to it today. May we yield to your spirit, God, to your gospel, the right gospel that is coming to make all things new. God, our, our desire should be for more of you and less of us. God, for more of your new and less of the old. God, may we ne never treat you like a patch or a crutch or just a temporary Band-Aid fix. But God, you are the great physician, the great healer, the one who knows our real need, the need for forgiveness of sin, and you have accomplished that through your death and resurrection. You have atoned for our sin through the shedding of your blood that we, through faith in Christ, might be made new and might be given a righteousness, clothed in righteousness, a new garment that is from you and never from us. We trust you. We hope in you. And we give you all the praise today. In Jesus' name, amen.